Good evening. Welcome to the April 2024 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Let's start with the introductions. I'll play Hollywood Squares as usual. Um, and please introduce yourself briefly um, when I call upon you, if you would. Rebecca, you're starting tonight. Hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner from the Defender General's Office. Grand. Julio. Uh, good evening. I'm Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General, Co Director of the Civil Rights Team. Thank you. Jeff Jones. Jeff Jones, uh, retired VSP, retired person, and uh, original appointee, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Farzana. Yes, Farzana Leva, Orleans County State's Attorney. And Farzana is replacing um, Tim Leaders Dumont, just so you all know. Anyway, he'll be coming as a guest, he says, now and then. Right. Uh, right? Did I get that wrong? Yes. No, you got it right. Yes. Okay. Chief Don Stevens. Hi, Don Stevens, Chief of the Nohegan Abenaki Tribe, Executive Director of Abenaki Help and Abenaki. Thank you. Great. Jess. Jessica Brown, uh, she, her pronouns, uh, at large appointee to the panel, and I am a professor at Vermont Long Graduate School and the director of our Center for Justice Reform. Thank you. Judge Morrissey. Hi, I'm Mary Morrissey. I am the judiciary representative on the panel. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Elizabeth. Hi, all. Elizabeth Morris, a Juvenile Justice Coordinator at DCF, although I am not the DCF designee. Got it. Thank you. Jennifer Pullman. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pullman. I'm the director for the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services, and I just continue to test the committee as a community member. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Grant. Hi, Grant Taylor here taking minutes for the group. Great. Thank you. Dan Bennett. Hey, Dan Bennett, State Police, Deputy Director, Fair and Impartial Policing, and I'm also Eitan's sidekick. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Sheila, my friend. <laughs> I almost thought he said psychic. I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to. I had to, I had to have an auditory processing thing happen for myself. So, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I, I know you know. <laughs> um, my name is Sheila Linton. She, her, um, hers pronouns. Um, panel member and executive director of the Root Social Justice Center. Great. Thank you. Uh, Laura Carter. I don't know if you guys can hear my husband talking to my cat in the background. Hi, I'm Laura Carter. I am uh, an analyst for the uh, DRJS within the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Mark Hughes. Unless you're just having your otter pilot do your thing tonight. I think that's what's going on. Anyway, he's listening in. Um, Representative Arsenal. Hi, everyone. I'm Representative Angela Arsenal from Williston. I serve on House Judiciary, so I'm here as a mostly as a listener. Thank you. Thank you. Jack Rose, please. Oh, having trouble with buttons today. Hi, Jack Rose, she, her pronouns. I uh, wish, uh, wish I had a title like a sidekick, but I don't. I am the uh, sole representative from DOC tonight. Derek had surgery today, so he's in recovery. He'll be fine. Uh, Great. Good to see you all. Thanks. And then Tiffany North Reed, please. <clears throat> You're muted. Yeah, that would that's not good. 
<laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm joining from the Office of Racial Equity. I'm the manager for the um, Division of Racial Justice uh, Statistics. Nice to see everyone this evening. And you. Have I missed anyone? I will guess not. All right. Well, welcome. Oh, no, here he comes. Reverend Hughes. Um, give him a moment. He's connecting to audio. Mark? Yes? Would you introduce yourself, please? Oh, hi. <clears throat> Sorry for being late, folks. Happened. Um, I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Great. Thank you. Oh, and here's Tyler. Tyler. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm coming a little bit late. Uh, name's Tyler Allen. I'm the Family Services uh, um, Division Adolescent Services Director, and I am the representative from DCF. It's good to be here. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we've got everyone. Yes. Uh, let's begin with the approval of the minutes. Um, we have both February and March, which I sent to you. Let's start with February. Does Is there any discussion regarding errata or, you know, things that need to be added, taken away, anything of that sort? Okay, um, seeing nothing, um, let's just vote then. I'll move to approve the February minutes. Thank you, Sheila. Would anyone like to second? Rebecca is seconding. Great, let's vote. All in favor of, of accepting the February minutes as submitted, please signify by saying aye or raising your hand or hands. Aye. 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 All opposed. Okay. All abstaining. Got it. The minutes are approved as submitted. Let's do the same with March. Is there any discussion about them? Changes that need to be made, corrections, reframings. Seeing none, would anyone like to submit a, uh, a motion to uh, accept the minutes? So moved. Thank you, um, Sheila. Sheila has moved to accept the minutes as submitted. Anyone seconding? Second. Grand. Another vote. All in favor, signify in an exciting way. Aye. 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 Okay, great. All opposed? Okay, all abstentions? Uh, this is Jessica, I'm abstaining because I was not at the March meeting. Got it, thank you. Uh, and still, uh, yes. Same, same here, I'm, I also wasn't at the March meeting, so I'm abstaining as well, thanks. Got it, okay, so we've got those two, you've got those uh, grant, those two abstentions. Um, but the minutes have passed as submitted. Uh, Julio, you have your hand up. Um, I think that's a software glitch. That, that, oh, that didn't tend to be that. Okay. All right. We've approved the minutes. Um, announcements. There are a bunch. You may have noticed that Julio's here and Aaron is not. And that is because Aaron no longer is um, working in state government and she has become the Chief of Staff for Mayor Mulvaney Stanick of Burlington. Um, and she wishes us well. Um, it was very sudden. I didn't know that was in the cards. She literally, a week ago, Monday, texted me at like eight o'clock in the morning to say, hi, it's my first day as Chief of Staff for M. Mulvaney Stanick. And I was like, oh, uh, great. Uh, thanks. So anyway, there's that. Um, the other issue, and it didn't make, I just put these all in announcements. Um, I did get in touch with both Witchy and Ching, and they would both like to do an exit interview. They're perfectly willing and think it's a great idea. 
Uh, I'd like to thank Mark Hughes for bringing that up very quickly at that last meeting. Um, and what we do need, though, is someone who's willing to do that. I don't actually have the free time right now to do that one as well. Um, is there someone, and I'll work with someone to, to get that going, but um, someone needs to take that project in hand. Is there anyone who's interested? Or how about this? Think about it. Send me an email. Let's do that. Think about who would like to do it. Send me an email and we'll go from there. Um, that's what I have on that front. Um, there's no hurry on it. Um, but as I say, the big thing is someone who really wants to lead that charge. I'm afraid I can't. Um, so there's that. Uh, forgive me for being a little disorganized. Hey, Tom, Go ahead. Yes. Since you're speaking to that, I presume that there isn't any qualification or role anybody on the panel. Can you be more specific? Is it anybody sure. on the panel? Is the panel appointed? Like, is can anybody do it? Anybody on the panel who's a member of the panel can do it. Yes. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Um, and, you know, as I say, just send an email. We'll go from there. No hurry, but let's, let's, if you would get me a, a decision in the next week or so, that would be really helpful. So we could at least move it along a little. Tyler. Thank you, Eitan. I don't want to disrupt that process. I think that might, you know, just make sense. Where is there a will who has the energy to, you know, energy and ability to do it? And let's just see what we have to work work with that makes some sense but i'm also wondering as i've explored exit interviews in the past we want to be mindful about what questions we ask uh, yes. especially because we usually have consistency um, yes. from interview to interview because if you want to track it you know from any kind of broader way you need they need to track into each other so i'm i'm wondering if it wouldn't be worth exploring if there are rather than just somebody volunteering to conduct an enter exit interview if okay. there couldn't be a group of people that might want to get together to define a process. Um, so I, I, just a suggestion for the group to consider. No, I think that's fine. And I would, the thing about the questions, you're absolutely right, but I wanted to get someone who was going to lead the charge on that. Cause I didn't want to be the one who, who took that one on, on top of everything else right now. Um, so I was hoping to get that, figured out and then we could have a whole discussion about questions oh i was looking up all sorts of things this month um there's a whole bunch of stuff to consider but in any event um sure if there's a group of people absolutely that's perfectly wonderful so write me <laughs> is that all right tyler I think that makes a lot of sense, Aton, and I probably would volunteer to be part of a group of people. I don't know if I have the capacity to to lead the charge. So, uh, but I'll 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 write you, Aton. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. That would be great. Aton. Right. Yes. Also, I um that was part of my question actually too was if we had any um materials already to do the exit or do we need to create them? And it we sounds like we need to create them. And I think that's a subcommittee. And I think that the subcommittee be, should be racially diverse. Um, um, and as so should the exit committee as well. And or for what people feel comfortable with, because um, just keeping it really real, depending on who is conducting or whom's are conducting those in exit interviews can uh, get a different response. Yes. And so I think it's important to have something you know, um, systematized. And I also think it's important to have more than one person in yep. the space and it be either defined by that person or be a racially diverse group of people to do the exit interview. Totally wonderful. Thank you. Let us do that. But, you know, write to me. Let me, let's, I just want to start with baby steps, but I absolutely agree 100%. There are, if you go online, there are a lot of examples of what an exit interview can look like. And what's really out there is people ask different things and it depends on the organization. 
So I was reluctant to bring those because I think we're going to have our own questions that we're going to want to ask. At least I'm assuming that was with a bit of a question at the end. Sorry. I'm hoping we're at questions we want to ask that are really germane to the RDAP. So once we get this group together, um, we'll go from there. And I, I'm willing to be part of a group that I can do. That I can do, but I can't do it all. So cool. Got it. Okay. Hey, Tom, I'm with you on that. I had some experience with interviews too. So if, if it's a group, I'm, I'm down to help you out. Oh, yes, you have had experience. Okay, great, <laughs> Jan. Thank you. All right. <laughs> um, wonderful. But please, everybody, I hear what you're saying, but also send me an email because I'll just be, you know how I get. It's not good. But anyway, those are the announcements that come to mind. Oh, no, they're not. Uh, got a lot of responses from the letter I sent. Um, positive ones, frankly. Um, I got a really lovely letter from um, the Commissioner of Corrections. I got a lovely letter from the Attorney General. Uh, I'm trying to remember, oh, Heather Simons, who's the Executive Director of the Police Academy and the Criminal Justice Council. Um, and lots of good conversation that I think will come out of that about what can support the RDAP, in fact. Um, I am, there's a little I can tell you, but I didn't get complete permission from the attorney general to like submit, so the letter was addressed to me. I just feel uncomfortable forwarding it without her permission. She hasn't been able to get back to me yet, but she raised a few points that she thought we should use for brainstorming. And I think they're really good. One of them, which I don't think is going to require a tremendous amount of brainstorming in the sense of should we get this or not, was the RDAP needs at least one staff person and funding for that. That was something she raised as like a point for us to think about. I like wanted to write back and go, yes, for the love of God, but for everything that's holy, please, some a staff member and um, money. Um, of course, money is tight. This money's always tight, but you know, everyone says money's tight. She recommends looking at some grants and things like that in order to um, fund these things. Um, another question that uh, she brought up that I think would be that she thought we might want to brainstorm about had to do with okay, come on, remember, remember, you had all this in your head. Um, The possibility of a vice chair, whether you all want that, whether you all want to do that, um, that'll be enough. I mean, that's another discussion. And I, I just wanted to raise everything tonight so that people can think about these things and we can have a broader discussion about it later. Um, and certainly, as soon as I get permission from her, assuming that I do, to just sort of forward that letter to you all, um, I will do that. And that'll make this a lot simpler. But that was another discussion that came up. Um, and those were the two big major points that she brought up. And I was, I, yay! <laughs> she thought those would be a great place to start. Um, I was so happy that someone was like coming up with, you know, we got to fund this better. I was like, oh, thank God. Yes, we really ought to. <laughs> So, um, you know, whatever we need to do. Um, so those were the two big points that came up. And that was from her letter. Um, Commissioner Demel wants to have lunch to kind of go over further, you know, the points that I raised in the letter. Um, I'm assuming that that's okay with everyone that I do that. Please say if it's not. Not that this is a vote formally. I'm just saying, tell me if it's not. Okay, um, and I'm also going to have a meal with the Attorney General, um, try to get this more figured out. It felt good to me. It, it felt very 
energizing that there were you know that the people for whom everyone's a proxy were sort of gonna you know they were really committing to the work of this panel and um certainly in uh the case of the attorney general you know a willingness at least to look for some money to get staff if we could get it and so one of our discussions will be you know what do we need for staff um she recommended someone who would keep up with the legislative moves which made me very happy um i'm sure it will make some of you very happy given what a mess this session has been um in terms of getting bills to us so that's that's the other thing um i think that we're going to be able to get some stuff moving that we've been hoping for for a long time um of course, right, Julio's here. We've already done that part. Julio's gonna be here for, I don't know how long, until they decide, until they decide who's going to be the attorney general's proxy. Um, And that's, those are the announcements. Any questions, Rebecca, questions? Uh, no, no question, just a comment. Uh, I, I appreciate you sharing, sharing the feedback from your letter uh, to the extent that, um, it is, it is nice to hear that the attorney generals seem supportive uh, or recognizing our need for staff, but you might share that we have repeatedly asked for that for a very long time. And I would be hesitant for us to get in the business of grant writing when we already yes. have no, no time for the subsidy stuff. But certainly you might you might share that that in our reports, we've been asking for additional support from the legislature by way of um, resources um, will do yeah, will thanks. do thanks. are you that i'm sorry did i interrupt you rebecca no no okay no. okay will do don just quick question also um i know there are certain agencies they have to be specifically put in statute to be able to receive grants and funding because they're not a 501c3 or not a, or so since you're since we are a Kind of, I don't want to say, gov well, government agency, uh, kind of, or appointed by the government. Are we allowed to even receive grants, um, you know, or hold funding in that capacity? I guess that's a legal question by the AG. Uh, um, I, I, anyway, I just know that the Commission on Native American Affairs had to get special, um, I think, put in the statute that they could actually solicit or hold grants because they are. Uh, an agency derived by the state. I'm not sure that we would have a problem, but I will check. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Okay. Um, and then um, I know that the the next item, possible discussion about a juvenile residential facility. I put that in as possible because at the last meeting, you'll recall, Sheila had brought this up. Um, Tyler was excited, but he was also like, can't do it this month. Um, and so, all right. But Sheila, I wanted to at least reserve the floor for you if you had something you wanted to, you know, say to the panel without... Um, you know, without Tyler's additions to that yet. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. That's so sweet. Uh, oh. <laughs> um, so uh, for those of you, some of you know me more intimate than others, but as um, the executive director of the route, we have programming and one of our programming is Youth for Change and Families United. And Families United is a program that, um, peer-based uh, families who are impacted by the um, DCF system. And Youth for Change is a peer-led group of youth who um, do a variety of different things. But one of the things that they do is they take on initiatives or campaigns or issues that they are passionate about um, to try to change or contribute their voices to in various different ways. So. Um, you for Change co-hosted an event at The Root, and we've had some other events through Families United about what's called the rest stop. And um, Tyler can speak more to the details of what it entails. But basically, 
um, from our points of views that it is a place that is where youth will be placed in transition from a home, but it's built around on with police. Um, and, um, whether that's utilizing their actual physical space, utilizing them as resources and, or collaborating with them as partners or other, other financial ways, it is a direct, um, correlation to police and goes against, you know, our values, um, in terms of what we believe, um, youth need for dignity, as well as overall what we believe at the root. And so the youth have been advocating for no rest stops. And I brought wanted to bring this to this group because of course we have Tyler here who is a part of DCF and we consistently throughout the years have not um, prioritized as much youth um, justice as maybe I would like. And I know that this year um, I voiced that again and I'm happy that we are making sort of that turn. And so as a issue, <laughs> there are many that are going on with this system. This is a big issue and big issue for our communities in particular. This event that we held had um, over two, three dozen youth who showed up and including Tyler, not to say that you're a youth Tyler, but <laughs> Tyler showed up as well, which was very nice. Um, but we, and these are youth who are impacted by the system, who have been through the system, are in the system, been impacted by the system, et cetera. And so, and they voice their concerns um, and their ideas and their trauma, and it's really deep. And so, of course, when we get into racial disparities, which is why we're all here, is like I start thinking, we all know that you can name anything, and I can't think of anything that doesn't really have a racial disparity to it. And so um, if you got something, let me know. We'll do that trivia later behind the scenes. But um, was thinking about what type of youth are being placed in these facilities and why as well. And disproportionately are those youth of color. So, you know, as there is many issues to juvenile justice overall, breaking it down for other reasons why we're here to focus on too is those racial disparities. And my concern that that, those rest stops are going to not only not be with youth need, but it will disproportionately affect youth of color. So I want us to bring that into the space. And um, I personally will just be transparent that I'm a thumbs down for um, this type of um, housing for our youth. Okay, no, great. So Tyler, do you have anything you wanna, I mean, you're not supposed to be talking, right? Cause like- no. Talking, but no. <laughs> uh, I would I would love to just chime in one thing. Um, sure. uh, a uh, first, I want to appreciate Sheila for bringing up this conversation to this group. I want to appreciate you for hosting that event and having me come participate. It was it was good to be there. It was a late night for me, but it was uh, it was a night well spent. Um, and I was really excited to have this conversation at the end of last month's meeting. Uh, and you heard that in my tone. And the reason why I said not this month was not because I'm not excited to have the conversation. It was because I went back to my deputy commissioner right away and I said, this is what we're talking about. And this is an opportunity to gather feedback from this group. And they want to talk about this. She's really excited about it too. And she wanted to be present. She was not available for tonight. So the reason that I said, can we wait until May's was because, um, you know, m my leadership wants to be part of that conversation too. Um, so that that's all. It's, it's Ram, not that I'm not thrilled to have it. No, I I I didn't mean to imply that. I just knew you that. Didn't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, no, it will be. It'll be at the you know after um, our introductions and announcements and approvals and so on. That'll be at the top of our agenda. Tiffany. Yes, um, I have a question about that because I, this is my first time hearing about this um, program. I'm wondering, and I wish I could have attended, I wish I had known about that event because I would have um, wanted to hear the perspectives from the youth, but I'm I'm wondering if um, this could be um, some kind of a, um, we could maybe have an information gathering um, slash report on this issue because um, we have been attending a lot of the legislative like hearings about the 
youth detention center and some of the issues, a lot of the issues, um, you know, related to that. I'm just wondering if um, there could be an opportunity for us to kind of gather data about what's been what's been done in other states. Um, and then also just on the ground, like um, learning more about this particular initiative and um, I think providing a space for the the youth to have a voice and um, you know, definitely we want to be in the lived experience framework as well as we're gathering information. I'm just wondering if this might be an opportunity to, uh, to do that. Okay, Rebecca, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I really, I really um, support Sheila bringing this issue to RDAP and getting this on our agenda. I think it's absolutely critical. From the Defender General's perspective, we have a lot of, uh, you know, information we can provide, um, whether it's historical, how we got here, what have, what existed before, why doesn't it exist now, and I'm referring to Woodside, and how do we make sure what happens next, as you say, Sheila, really addresses, you know, the needs uh, and, and, and incorporates the voices of the youth and also doesn't uh, ignore and, and, and is, is acknowledging what happened in Woodside to not have it happen again. I think that um, it would make sense if, if, again, the panel is interested in pursuing this subject further to have uh, who, our expert from the Defender Generals come to speak to RDEP on it. Uh, Marshall Paul, who is both our def deputy and the uh, juvenile defender for our system and has, has um, deep expertise in this area. Um, and, and he can provide data, he can provide the racial disparities um, and, and the experience of Woodside, history on that, why that happened or not, um, and other thoughts. So okay. I, I offer him up and he's not here, but he didn't know this was on our agenda today. And so I gave him a uh, preview that this might be coming. Okay. And he's in, if you're Great. interested. Tiffany, is, when you talk about the data, does it, is this, I guess I should sort of be talking to both you and Rebecca. Rebecca, what form is the data that you have that the ODG has in? Is it in a report of some form? I won't, I won't uh, claim to, to say all the data that, that Marshall Paul has available. I know a lot of it is actually also in the hands of, of DCF and their reporting requirements to the federal government uh, in terms of of uh, demographics based on race and ethnicity in terms of who's who's been held in secure detention facilities by the state. And, and, and they have those going back several, I don't know how far back, um, but there is more. And, um, and I think Marshall has shared some of that data with this group in other contexts, but uh, I can get back to you. Okay, and that would be something, yeah, because I, I, Tiffany, is that the sort of thing that you would like? Yes, it, it would be significantly helpful. Um, and I think anything that would aid what you're trying to do here, um, we we want to support. I think as we 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 kind of um round out the division and right. start to you know get resources, um, put together resources, I think, for um policymakers, for the public. Um, these are the kind of issues that we want to tackle and um, I think use as a platform in some way, because I think if we have information and we have reports, we can, you know, we can support listening sessions and just getting the information out and understanding um, okay. what needs to happen next, maybe from an advocacy standpoint, you, standpoint, just in terms of getting those resources out. So I think if you have ideas to kind of help us structure what that might look like and or what the needs are, we definitely want to be available to help. Right. Great, thank you. Uh, Tyler. I just want to share briefly that we have a great deal of resource within the room here. So the report that Rebecca was speaking to that Marshall would probably come in and speak to, those very data are um, are pulled, analyzed, and reported out by our own Elizabeth Morris, who's on this group. So we do have pretty ready access to getting at right. some of the data that we use, those federal data. Um, I also want to just clarify this group. I, I don't want to get ahead of the conversation that I promised my deputy commissioner that she could be part of, but I, I want to make sure that this group, this group knows that um, while we could frame 
all of the stuff we've talked about so far kind of related to the crisis of the day from the DCF perspective. There is a difference between the development of our, you know, of secure treatment programming, of um, uh, uh, psychiatric mental health treatment programming. You know, there's several le levels of system of care that we're talking about. That is distinct from the practice of using the rest stop. Um, the rest stop, there is nobody making the argument that that is a preferred um, uh, treatment setting or placement setting even. Uh, that's kind of patently something we all want to step away from. So they might there might be two discussions to be had in there, and I'm hesitant to lump them yes. into one. I was wondering that myself. So we could do this over two months easily, right? Over two meetings. We could have your deputy commissioner, whose name, sadly, I do not know. Her um, name is Erica Radke. Thank you. Um, and we could have what her i mean next month since you've already sort of put that out there for her and then in uh whatever the next month is after that i'm really feeling stupid tonight that would be june um uh would can you rebecca can you ask marshall about being here for june i will I'll great ask him. all right sheila does that all work for you That works for me. Great. All right. We've got this set. And so that will be on our agendas for May and June. Thank you all. Cool. All right. Now the really fun part. Uh, <laughs> discussion concerning bills with an equity focus currently at play in the legislature or slash how to get a functional pipeline between legislature and the RDAP. Well, let me start with this. I, I put Rebecca down for this one because this is something we've been talking about. But I also want to say we spoke about this at our last meeting and about writing a letter to the vice chair uh, and chairs of both um, Senate Judiciary and House Judiciary. What was kind of interesting, I I had to testify, you may remember, the day after our last meeting. and. Martin Lalonde, poor man. I mean, he just looked so, he looked exhausted. And he said, I, I am totally up for having this conversation with the RDAP in the summer. And I was like, oh, I let it go. And then I emailed him later. Actually, we talked on the phone and I, I think we did, didn't we? We emailed, I get something, we were in touch. And, you know, I was kind of like, you know, maybe sooner. And sooner is just not going to happen for these people right now. Um, I We can talk about whether that's right or wrong or whatever. It's just not happening for them right now. Um, so that's what I wanted to let you know on that front. I did not then, in the end, write the letter because it was very clear from conversations that that was something that would have to happen later than this session. I was not perhaps, yeah, I mean, I was hoping for earlier, but people had lives, you know, and so I just let that go. I wanted to report that out to you. That's all I wanted to put out. If you've got any questions or comments, please put them forth. Um, and then otherwise, Rebecca, if you've got any further thoughts. I always have further thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on this on this subject, um, I, I I would I, I'd second your 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 reaction or your your thoughts on this. I, I do I, I'm in there regularly for the Office of Defender General. I see not just the chair, but uh, Representative Arsino is on. I, they're they're all going full day I and mean, we were just yes. I was at the closing I think I, actually I, they did, hadn't adjourned till about left at 4 35 today uh so um that seems uh, a reflection of the realistic demands on on his clock and, and their clock so I'm not surprised by that but here's here's here are my thoughts I know that agenda item suggested I might be sharing some relevant bills that I think raise or carry consequences of potential race dis racial disparities. And I think I, there's not time 
is the short answer. And, and I've shared this before, and, and it's sort of triggered my comments before in, in, in past meetings. I think that um, I think that we have we know that that certain committees, I think it's the judiciary has, has reached out to you asking for you or others on this panel to come and testify with not a lot of notice, certainly not realistic notice that that lets us get there. And I'm saying us collectively. Uh, not myself personally, because again, I'm I'm in there regularly as part of my my duties at the Defender General's office. Uh, so we know they want us on particular bills. I'm in there to share that I, at least the bills I've seen, you could be, we could be, RDAP could be there for all of those. Uh, right. I see race, uh, racial disparities or potential impact um, on every bill that proposes an enhanced penalty, a new penalty. Uh, felonizing prior misdemeanors, uh, creation of new crimes, significant changes to bail where our, where rights are changed, right? Where there's a presumption to hold, there are the easier burdens on the state, all of which uh, I'm saying as a reflection of my expertise as a criminal defense attorney and a defender and representing clients generally, and then knowing how that plays out to my clients who are black and brown or from communities uh, historically disadvantaged. And, and of course, my clients are uh, indigent. So they are by definition uh, impoverished. And I see just that group being, uh, you know, having more impact by these, these policies. So I think, and we have panel members here who I hear, you know, they come in to say contrary positions, not necessarily on the on the racial ethnic impact, but state's attorney's office, right? And attorney general's office, department of corrections, regularly and in these same committees, often on these same bills, um, having different viewpoints. So I, I don't know that it's useful for us for me to share my particular viewpoint. I think this, I think that we have a structural problem yes. fundamentally to being able to respond to the legislature's request on specific bills. As a panel member and as a member of the Defender General's office, I see so many bills having huge impact and they are not hearing. I'm part of these, these witnesses. I can see the witness list once once they pass out of the committees and cross over. They are, there are some significantly scary, substantial changes to criminal codes, entire sections like the drug codes I talked about last session where they are not hearing from a single community member of color, period. We are sometimes the only ones, or maybe the ACLU, ACLU will be in there, or someone from Susanna Davis's office. But there are three witnesses, and you think, and you compare the witness list of who else is coming in, and there is disparities in terms of where the, those interests are being represented. So I see a huge role for RDAP, of course. How to do it? Do we put this? Do we create a subcommittee as our next agenda for the year, uh, as to our recommend? how we can do this structurally? Is it that there's an alternative entity in place? Not us. Is it that we do it, but only if we're resourced a certain way? My recommendation to this group right now this month is that we consider this month, next month, next agenda, whether we want to pursue this more seriously, treat it like akin to our second look to the subcommittees we created last year, the data entity, so that we can come to a recommendation perhaps sooner than the fall. Again, oh, yeah. this for when the legislature would be taking draft requests mm -hmm. in the summer. Um, uh, and, and, and have a subcommittee of people who hopefully would represent a, a cross section of this panel um, and, and come together to make a rec recommendation. Okay, okay. Um, that would also be something that when I have lunch with the attorney general, I will bring up is somebody who, you know, when she, in her letter, she had said, in the interest of brainstorming, we may want to think about, you know, this person who would, in fact, um, do exactly what you're saying and bring us up to speed, keep monitoring all of the bills that go through. I mean, the other issue that I think of is um, ORE has this really lovely equity impact assessment, and I'm sort of like, why isn't that being used? I mean, it's precisely for bills that, I mean, that was one of the 
that was one thing that it was supposed to focus upon. And I'm not hearing those being completed. Um, thank you, Laura. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm just kind of like, I, right. And Reverend Hughes says that they're voluntary. Exactly. Um, but I think we may need to make more noise about that now because that's simply not happening. And as a lot of people um, on the panel and both people who are, who are guests, I mean, Mark brought this up last time very eloquently, um, they're just not asking. There's, they're just not, there's, there's just not questioning coming about that sort of issue. Um, for me, um, if you perceive that there is a crime wave, and I say perceive because I have some different ideas about that, um, that's precisely the moment at which civil rights have to be put forth. It's easy to put them forth when you feel safe. When you don't, it's very easy to just pass by them. And so I think that that may be an issue there. I mean, if you haven't seen the equity impact assessment, um, I, it's on, uh, Laura, Tiffany, it's on the web, it's on your website, right? Yeah, I'll put a link in the chat. Thank, Thank you. you, Laura. I have I have a question too. Is it about people not knowing about the equity um, impact tool, and also how do we get the word out? Because I've literally had direct questions um, in the past two weeks about where can people go for equity tools. So I just think people um, may not know that we have this as a resource, and just I don't know if you have any recommendations on how to get the word out. And Representative Arsenic says yes. Um, that there. Um, I think we. I guess we have to think about that. Tyler, you had your hand up. I did, I, and I think I'm just going to show a little bit of ignorance here. But I'm I'm going to be comfortable. This is a safe space. <laughs> um, so ah. we. I I'm I'm aware of. Excuse me. Uh, an equity, a racial equity impact assessment that goes for you know for bill reviews um, moving up. Uh, in the executive branch, like when we're considering any bills and thing, is that a different tool than what we're talking about here? Or is it the same thing? I, I, so is there a tool that's specifically targeted for being developed in the legislature or by a committee or something along those lines? Not that I know of. There's, oh. at the, I mean, that tool is very broad and, you know, really rather yeah. that it um, can be used in a variety of circumstances, I should think. Because I know we use we use it internally. Right. I've seen many go through, but I don't know where it all always goes to. There are two coach that coach two oh, what? Okay. There are two. Ah, the Social Equity Caucus has a tool as well, um, and Coach can speak to that. That's from Representative Arsenault. Um, the tool, the tool that. Uh, was developed by the caucus uh, was a multi-faceted tool uh -huh. um, that we engaged a number of different folks in that process. We flipped the paradigm upside down. So instead of it being a legislative uh, uh, led process, it was a community led process. Uh, we had an 18 member uh, committee and of the 18, 16 were community members and only four were legislators. Okay. So that was, that was the paradigm shift. Uh, and one of the outcomes of that work was the, uh, the tool that came from the caucus. Uh, okay. And it is being used like other tools, uh, uh, not as widely as we would hope, um, but it's available and people that are aware are asking the questions. But okay. is it being used enough? No, just like the uh, Office of Racial Equities tool. Is it being used enough? No, you know, so uh, the combination of the two, if we could get it uh, peppered throughout the process, we'd be making better strides. We should look at both of them, I think. 
because I am not as familiar with the one from the SEC. Rebecca, you have a question. Uh, no question, just a comment to add. I, I would also just say that other states, other state legislatures have passed uh, equity impact assessment laws. Yeah. So that it's not voluntary, it's right. required and similar to environmental impact studies, right? Uh, that is people are more familiar with, state governments are more familiar with. Uh, but absolutely, I'm glad that um, that these two tools have been brought up because they should be, you know. So, so again, bringing this back, if we wanted to continue with this, whether I, I see that one of the comments Tiffany Northreed offered up a presentation on, on one assessment tool, I think we should have both. Whether we want it to be at the um, panel-wide level, I, I think is a great idea. Um, but here's again an opportunity where a subcommittee could dive deeper and look at what other states have done, ideas actually passed, how it's gone, how it could be improved, um, and bring that back to the panel. Then let's, do you want to make a subcommittee now or do you want to look at the assessment tools first and then go from there? That's just a general question. How do people feel about this? It's just a question of process. Anybody? How about this then? <laughs> um, how about we do the presentation from ORE? I think it would be good. It would be nice to have it from the SEC as well, but I don't know who we can get for that. Coach, do you have any ideas on that front? Okay, I'm uh, driving, so oh, I, I'm I, sorry. Uh, I'll, no, 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 no. I wanted to. Uh, I saw the agenda, so I thought you know I should, uh, you know, like be here for this one. And uh, so my thinking is, let's let's see if we can get you know a group. There are there's a couple of committees that are using it, you know, more actively, and I think if we got. Um, a couple of those folks, they could do, give you a much clearer picture of what it looks like on the ground. Okay. If that helps. Yeah, no, it would be, it would be nice to hear from them, in fact. Um, I, I, I'm thinking House General, uh, they use it more actively. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, they, they get a lot of the bills that cross pollinate right. with a lot of the things that we're involved in. Okay. Yep. How, all right. How do people feel about the a presentation on the tool that ORE um, invented? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Tiffany, let's do that for next month. Okay, that sounds good. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll reach out um, to the affinity space. Sure. Uh, and see who we could get to uh, to do a, uh, a mini presentation for that as well. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we'll be in touch, you and I. Great. Um, Great. Good. So that'll be there too. Um, and Representative Arsena says that she would volunteer to work on that bill request if she's reelected. So grand, we'll work on that. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, but that sounds like something that's important. Tiffany would like a link to the SEC assessment tool. Is that possible, Coach? Uh, if if Tiffany goes to the uh, uh, SEC's website, okay, uh, it's it's there. Okay, Is that all right, Tiffany? I'm on there. I've been looking, and it 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 may be my fault. It's late in the day, um, 
<laughs> it's yeah, I'm certain it's there. Um, I, I, I'll I will look and because um, I, I think that will be a useful comparison and just so we see where we overlap and sure. maybe even what what we might we might be missing. So um, I appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, I'll look. Thank you so much. And we'll move on to that one. And as Reverend Hughes says, there's no equivalent in the Senate. Isn't that interesting? I hmm. Why can't they just use the same one? Well, well, the th the thing is, it is there, but because there isn't a commitment on the part of the Senate to utilize it, it's just there. Okay, that helps. <laughs> That helps because, enormously, in fact. Thank you. Okay. Because the majority leader, the majority leader was part of the committee that helped bring that to fruition. Got it. Okay. So, you know, they don't they don't get a you know like a buy on that, you know, other than they're the uh, more deliberative body. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> Okay. So, if you detect a little humor in my voice. Uh, just a tad, sir. Just a tad. Um, okay. No, I, I, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. We link to your, it is the same assessment. So I don't know who originated it. It sounds like your group, um, but we reference your tool. So I think we're talking about the same tool. The state of Vermont impact assessment tool revised in 2022 is what we have on our website. So it sounds like we're, we're using the same thing. And no, we just, no, I no, think, there, no? No, there are two, there are two. Um, yours, yours is a little more detailed um, uh, in, you know, step-by-step. Step. You know, ours takes a little more global approach because of the legislative, you know, aspect, you know, of the process. But okay. when you do the side by side, you know, you can really see, uh, you know, how they fit together. Okay, will do. Okay, thank you so much. You know, because they 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 are a brother and sister tool. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> For lack of a better metaphor. <laughs> Siblings, yes. All right. So we're going to go. Um, Representative Arsenault has put something in the. Um, yeah, I just, right. I think I think I got I think I picked up what coach was was talking about. It's the probing equity questions. Right, coach? Yes, exactly. Exactly. OK. So that'll be here. Good. Thank you. All right, so that will be our next. Um, and I guess what I'm going to say is look through them. Look through them. If, you've no, if you have no familiarity with them, please look through them so that we can have a substantive conversation um, next month. So, because we need to, this will be part of something. I, 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 what I'm thinking is that this would be something I would raise with the Attorney General that she's offered the notion that that might you know the the idea of having some kind of staff for this panel um and that might be something you know someone who in fact makes goes through the legislation and makes sure that various committees um are in fact looking at those assessment tools and using them yeah and using them and so I can bring that up as something that the panel's concerned about. I mean, it's sort of an outgrowth of everything we've been talking about this session. Because, I mean, they haven't even contacted the Racial Justice Alliance about stuff. I mean, it's been what? ACLU, sometimes the Defender General, <laughs> never the RDAP. Um, I mean, it's been a little strange. And I really do mean it when I say that. You know, I know that there's a bunch, of, and people have said to me, well, you know, we're we're worried about this this crime wave, and I have to say personally, you know, transparency here. If you look at the FBI website, violent crimes are at a historic low. 
mm, nationwide. Yeah. Nationwide. Um, property crimes are up in various locales, but not nationwide. They're up in places like New York, places like Los Angeles. Um, San Francisco shut down nine Target stores in the Bay Area because of theft. And then somebody from um, one of the independent media sources, uh, I'm trying to remember which one it was, I'll find out, went and did a study. And in fact, those nine stores were underperforming. Right, right. And the stores that were nearby are still wide open and ready for business. So Target lied. Um, and there's a lot of that sort of thing that seems to be going on. So I'm a little suspicious when I start hearing about, you know, crime waves, mm -hmm. just sort of a blanket crime wave. And, you know, then every, and as I say, and I think we have proof of this, people, when they hear that, well, we have to get on this, you know, we have to solve the crime wave. And questions about civil rights and the stuff that we do around racial disparities is put on a back burner. When I would argue that's precisely the moment when it needs to be on the front burner. Well, remember, uh, Eitan, this is sometimes used to manipulate the discussion. Shock. Shock, Diane. You know? And... <laughs> You know, like I, uh, I go back to something that, uh, you know, I, I learned in recovery and it's the definition of fear because it's a tool used to create a fearful environment, you know, and yeah. all of a sudden you're in control when everybody's fearful. But right. When you take fear and you put it out, False evidence appearing real. Right. <laughs> I like it. But I do. I, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I, I thought you'd appreciate that. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I may be a little bit off of, um, you know, topic right now. But I do think that this is really a sort of central issue that's got to be thrown back to the legislature mm -hmm. for next mm -hmm. session. Um, but that's really got to come up because this behavior is really disturbing to me. It's making me very nervous. You can all disagree with me, please. I know I'm sounding like I know everything and I don't. I don't know. There's a lot I don't know, but I'm just saying I've been doing some research and things are not quite what they seem at least in what I'm looking at. Aha. Uh -huh. you, you know, you, you've, you've answered your own question. I think so. But, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, in either case, I just, an equity impact assessment and a bill that mandates it, that it must happen, that, you know, becomes a law. I don't think there's a problem with that. I think that gets us around some of the stuff that we're dealing with right now. Well, well, see, that's that's it, Aton. You know, sorry to kind of join in and take take a lot of the conversation, but one of the things, having done this work for a minute, as my kids would say, <laughs> that's what I see, and that's what happened. You know, you take the good work of the Office of Racial Equity, you take the good work of the Social Equity Caucus. They developed these two tools and then tried to, uh, in the Office of Racial Equities perspective, really, you know, move that through state government. And as we've been hearing, some people do it with fidelity and some people don't. Right. On the legislative side, we had the biggest transition in legislators just as we were right. formulating you know, the probing equity questions. So it was kind of easy for leadership, both in the House and the Senate, to go, eh, it's not that high on the priority list. Right. Okay, so all that work that we did to develop that, 
and the sense that it makes, you know, it's just kind of floating out there. Yeah. You know, and as long as nobody says anything about it, you know, they, you know. No, so I, that's, I, that's the rest of the story, I guess. Right. But I think this is a good place to, to focus, actually. It might, it would help. Oh, yeah. Um, and then as far as getting the pipeline established, I would suggest, I, I think we have to hear what the Attorney General has to say about yeah. what we would get for staff. Yeah. Um, does anyone see a, a different path here that I'm missing? Okay. Um, I will definitely be very firm about that. Thank you all. Great discussion. Um, anything else on this? Okay. Um, the last three <laughs> items, state of letters to the legislature, we've sort of talked about that. Exit interviews, we talked about that. And I put on there the possible review of the letter to me from the attorney general. I gave you as much of one as I could do without really getting permission from her to share it. And I did, I really, maybe I'm old school. I just don't feel comfortable sending out a letter to a group of people that was addressed to me without permission. And so I, I, understand she's very busy and you know i but i'm gonna work at that again and then likely if she agrees i will send it out by email um and then mark's comment in chat there should be an implementation delay on criminal justice reform rollbacks to allow for an outside impact assessment review to enable us to understand the totality of the collective policy changes. This will also allow for a racial equity review of state investments in systems of prevention, mental health, and other social support. We will write that. We, uh, go ahead, Rebecca. I will, I'll stop right now. Um, you know, thank you, Mark, for putting that in the chat. You raised that I think last month as well. And I, think, I think that it's worth just putting another pause on that point because what we're talking about in terms of the frustration, the collective frustration seems to be asked and not having the structural ability to provide real time insight. And this talk about developing and meeting with the chairs this summer and um, perhaps next session, Mark's point is well taken. And I think we can and should as a panel consider whether we want to make any immediate re, uh, take any immediate action now for this session by way of even just this proposal. Uh, I know um, I, I, I like that certainly sends a message and that could be it's a different type of letter. It could be a different way or form yes. to communicate this to the legislature, but instead of asking the chairs of the judiciary committees to come and join us for conversation. It can be a letter from our committee or from our panel to these chairs. Uh, okay. Encompassing the ideas of Marcus. I don't know how other panel members feel. But I would support that. Does anyone want to take that letter on? I know that was like a major jump, wasn't it? <laughs> but seriously, does anyone want to take that letter on? We did say it was a priority. We know, Mark. We're trying to get there. All right. Um, hey, there. Tom. Hi, yeah. hi folks. Um, would Mark, would you mind, just for my understanding, also just clarifying the scope of what is referenced in the reforms? Is that like any legislation that sat in the criminal legal space that is making its way through this current legislative session? Or is it uh, a, like a more defined set of particular bills? <laughs> 
<laughs> and he's he's throwing that to Rebecca. <laughs> Well, I, I actually, I'm going to throw this back to the panel. We have just been talking generally about whether we want to turn this into a, a major priority item. I, I call it major, but we have two right now that I'm sensing for this upcoming calendar year yes. of what are adapts, and we haven't really, I think, formalized where we, are, we have, where we're going next after the report. And, and now, you know, Shayla's uh, discussion point, um, on, on on the residential uh, facilities for youth, and then right. this seems to be taking shape. But is there a panel, uh, you know, wide interest in 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 this? Because um, if there is, I, I don't I don't think it's it's such a radical thing for this panel to say we're concerned that that there are there's um, we've been re you know we've been asked to come we haven't been able to provide it uh i don't you know that there that there should be a racial impact uh assessment or considerations done before um whatever whatever kinds of bills we want to talk about uh, are passed i would volunteer it's just i'm a little overwhelmed at the moment all right I'll find time. I'll find time. Okay. Mark, I'd like to be able to talk to you on a fairly frequent basis if I might. Just want to say that. Thank you, sir. Okay. I will uh I will get going on this like ASAP. I just I just need you all to know that. I'm as busy as you are right now, and it, it there's there's not a lot of space, or you know, but I will do. I will get on it. Um, as okay, great. That's yeah? a, a, a town at the risk of um, hopefully not uh, unduly, but well intendedly, um embarrassing or calling in in a way that's unwanted. Um, my colleague from ORE, Jay Green, uh, last week, H645 was in front of Senate Judiciary, and not unlike so many other bills, which is, of course, the point here, there was not an invitation specifically for ORE to testify, but Jay did a wonderful job uh, submitting a letter. So uh, it's it's a Senate Judiciary, it's H645. It was submitted for under documents and handouts last Thursday. And it was specific to that bill, but they provided some really wonderful contextual language in the beginning of the letter that basically made this same point that said, you know, all too often reforms in this space, unless they are explicit about the equity component you know that just sort of you know fritters away and so my intent by mentioning this is hopefully again and I, I don't think Jay's here I believe Laura is but but a it's great work and I celebrate it and b it might save you a little thought capital in that obviously while you wouldn't take their exact language uh, I would recommend it for a nice little piece of you know sort of adjacent inspiration and well, uh, I, I yeah. think the letter would be really useful if it if it cites oh thank you laura um thanks laura um if no it, you know if we're taking saying hi the racial justice alliance is concerned with this the office of racial equity is concerned with this rdap would like to weigh in on this you guys put this together to do this kind of work and you're not like using us what the hell? What gives? Yep. Right. Um, I mean, I won't say what the hell. That's a little unprofessional, but you know, um, <laughs> something to be effective. We are confused, um, you know, in any event. Um, yeah, I, I just think it's a great example of how you have to take an outsider approach to what should be a de facto part 
of the legislative process. It's making the marginal mainstream. Yeah. I, I can also say, um, it, just to add on to that, and I appreciate Jay and Laura for um, their work on tightening up the language. I know initially, I think we submitted some language um, recommendations back in, might have been February or January, um, probably was February. But I, I do remember also that um, we're, we kind of have similar challenges. And I think, you know, often we're kind of at the last minute, like, oh, we might get a requ request. And it's literally like we're on it the day of and just so we can get we can turn it around. So I think if there is a way to start to see what you all do or come up with, because it, it is ideal to have more time to kind of draft the language and be available to testify. Um, but I think we 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 understand it's similarly kind of the challenges and just the the, the magnitude of bills and yeah. um, just trying to attend all the all the hearings that we that we see that are equity related. And we're just like, OK, just in terms of having the number of staff to follow them and provide um, supports there. Um, we definitely take, we, we understand the, the challenges. Okay. Thank you. I, can I also just piggyback off of that and just of echo course. something that Rebecca Turner said earlier about how pretty much every bill right now has some kind of, um, maybe unintended impact or unintended consequences regarding equity issues, racial equities, racial disparities, all of those kinds of things. So we are trying our best to monitor everything, but. Just a lot. There's a lot out there. Uh, yeah, I <laughs> we know. Um, Julio, I've got a question for you, and that is uh, the open meeting laws. I can write a letter, but then what? I cannot send it electronically and do this all that way. I have to bring it to the next open warned meeting if i am am i right about this oh, the letter to whom i guess I'm, I'm not clear i think that this letter will probably let's see who who do we want the letter to go to about bill obfuscation joint judicial oversight both House Judiciary and Senate Judiciary. Those are all questions. I don't know if that's close for the group or me. I'm, you know, I'm no, those are open this. questions okay. to the group. I'm sorry, okay. Julio. Okay. I'm sorry. Let's see, Rebecca Turner, for what's worth, yes. Those are all good suggestions. Okay, okay, then we can just do that. Um, if somebody, uh, Derek. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm sure like many of us, we kind of toggle between trying to take a more tactical approach and refining the audience with the hope of having a more specific impact as opposed to a broader, like I remember the only thing I remember, I think from CPR training is like if somebody needs somebody you don't just shout out like hey somebody get somebody right you point to somebody specifically and say right. you you know and, and that would suggest a more refined scope but on the flip side there's really nothing that comes through the legislative branch that does not call in and have equity implications right i mean there it, it's it, it is about the fundamental structures through which we regulate and uh, allocate point. resources and constitute ourselves as individuals, as communities. So I just want to voice that sort of yes and. It part of me feels like, do we like? I just want us to make a conscious decision sure. about if that's a tactical approach, because I don't want to reify this notion that racial equity is only the purview of the criminal legal system because that then then of course we just continue the pigeonholing too. Yes. Oh. 
I'll hold off for a moment. Mar? I appreciate you, Derek. <clears throat> um, and, I, and at the same time, uh, when, we, um, when we first envisioned the RDAP, um, when I think it might have been H-496 in House Judiciary in 2017, um, and the thought process was, is, was oversight. It was oversight of the criminal justice system. We started with Title 20, 2358, and 2368, uh, 2366 rather, which is fair and impartial policing policy, training, and race data collection. We, start, we wanted to expand, and expand into other areas like use of force, so on and so forth. Long story short, it was all about <clears throat> racial disparities in the criminal justice system. That's what the RDAP was envisioned for. That's what you were Right. That's what right. you are actually um, commissioned to do, which is why you're under the attorney general's office. Right. Perfect. And thank uh, you and for I, that regrounding. That makes total sense. Yep. So, I, so I just, you know, so I just want to make sure that that's important. And, you know, it's important to understand. And I think it's the other thing, too, Eric, is, you know, from on this side of the fence, what it looks like looking in that direction is, is that, <clears throat> you know, post reconstruction. You know, when you start looking at, you know, from a historical context, we know the blowback after 1877 um, and the, um, the, how, how we fell back as a nation in white lash. Uh, we, we, see, we saw the same thing happen uh, post-civil rights uh, when everything was burning down in 68 and moving forward uh, when we elected Richard Nixon and decided to have a war on drugs. <clears throat> And this is this is your third white lash, my friend. Right. So I just want to make sure that it's really clear that you know one of the reasons why um, this is significant as well at this moment because we are in a moment of history. I realize there's a lot of people on this call that maybe you're not watching national news or maybe you're not correlating what it is that we're doing here as a nation or or maybe you're not tuned in to what's happening allegedly politically um but i just want to make it very very clear um what it you know what's happening right now is i'm not going to call it unprecedented because it's the third time that hap that it's happened as a nation but i'm going to say let's dial in um let's pay attention to what's going on and let's Let's do what it is that we came to do here. Yep. Um, so I'll leave it there. You know, and, and I think one of the frustrating things, and I appreciate the moment here, Aton. One of the frustrating things here is, is while all of this is going on, we have a constitutional amendment for yes. equal protection. A constitutional amendment, lawyers, for equal protection. And I don't see anybody from the RDAP showing up and offering any testimony at all. I hadn't heard a peep out of the attorney general's office, Julio. A constitutional amendment for equal protection. Come on, folks. Hmm. So that did come out of House Judi uh, Senate Judiciary and, it, and it's, it, it's had its first day. Right. And what came out of that? It sits, it sits, uh, it will sit there for five days and then it'll go to the full floor of the Senate. Uh, the okay. Senate has to vote on, the Senate has to give it a two thirds vote for it to cross over. Okay. And where after, after which time it goes to the House, the House has to have a hearing and it needs to have a majority vote. Um, it needs to come out of the uh, House Judiciary and needs to have a majority vote on the floor of the House and come back to the Senate before session ends. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. Now that I get. Um, who, Mark, is doing testimony on this and where, if anyone that you know of? Uh, Office of Racial Equity offered testimony, the, the, uh, the, the folks over at, uh, at the um, ACLU offered testimony and BIG over at HRC offered testimony. Uh, okay. The Women's Commission showed up as well. Uh, okay. th th those were testimonies in the affirmative. Got it. Thank you kindly. 
so I'm feeling like that letter, Derek, I hear what you were saying, but I, I'm sort of with Mark on this. We're here for. Me too. Absolutely. And, and thank you for bringing me back to that. I, I sort of. Uh, I, I sort of. Lost the lack of that, that origin story because of obviously how intersectional this all is, but that hundred sure, percent. Sure. No, I I don't disagree in any way, shape, or form, and that is the charge of the RDAP, and right. staying staying in that lane, and being as impactful as possible in that lane, which is a big lane, is where we want to be. Yep. Right. Yep. Okay. Um. So then, that question that I raised to you, Julio, which would have been, which is about writing this letter, and getting feedback from the panel intersects in interesting ways with the open meeting laws. Is that something you can address? Not at the moment. I mean, I'm, we have other folks in our office who enforce or provide guidance on the open meeting laws. That's not a civil rights unit. Right. Um, so I, I can check back. I mean, I don't know that it would be any different than the drafting process that you've used for other RDAP reports. I'd love other. that. Um, but that's that's just that's just my intuitive reaction. I don't. I mean, just because it's a letter to the legislature, you know, either in the form of testimony or it could be. Uh, I mean, sometimes our office we we just submit documents. So, like, if there's a, a parallel state law, we just provide a list of the law. Okay. Without testimony, as a, as a as part of building legislative record. Well, I was. References, so. Yeah, I, I I was just thinking because I'll start writing this, but then I want it, it goes so much more easily if I can send it to panel members and people can give feedback and say, I don't like this part. Here's what I would recommend, or you know, something like that. It works so much better if we remember that we're in the 21st century and not in the 18th, where you know people can actually right. use the tools we all have and right. Um, and I would like to do that, but if I'm going to get, you know, pilloried for it, I. Well, I think what you're talking about then is a shorter process whereby the, the letter would be written before there's another RDAP meeting so that there would be zero opportunity for transparency with the public and input from the public. Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I just know, I mean, Aaron made a big point about the open meeting laws and what we could do and what we can't do. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. She was as frustrated as everybody else with this. I'm just trying to get some clarity because all I want to do is say I will work on it and I'll send a draft to everybody. Mark it up, <laughs> tear it apart, do whatever you want, send it back, and we'll put it together like that before the next RDAP meeting. Is but I think, but, but the idea being that the, the draft letter would ultimately be discussed in the meeting, or or yeah, simply, I'll bring it at the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, that that would help me frame the question for them. And Erin would have been more knowledgeable for me because she worked in the division that deals with public records, and I do not. It's okay. Just the way right. we, we, you know, we uh, specialize or divide our work into. Well, I'm just an ignorant musician. I can't be expected to know the law, so maybe that's and, what I'll just do. You and, know? and I, I'm the first to admit I'm not as familiar with the open meeting laws, Aaron. <laughs> Let's go with that. All right. All right. I've been on it, okay. folks, and thank you all for those of you will, who will um, help. Um, I will. I'm not going to say when I'm going to start. I will. It, it will get done. It will get done. I'm just going to leave it there so my blood pressure doesn't go through the roof. Um, that really takes us through the agenda for tonight. Anyone have any new business? Well, we have a lot. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we just threw a bunch out. Um, but any other new business? Okay. Um, thank you all. Our next meeting is the 14th of May. Um, you will see a draft letter before then. Um, I don't think it needs to be very long and it won't be. Um, and it'll quote a lot of things. Um, and rather than go through the ridiculous process of voting ourselves to adjourn, does anyone feel like we should continue talking? 
That's a new wrinkle on Roberts, by the way, that I just came up with. Hey, Tom. Yep. Yes. I just wanted to um, put out that the Richard Kemp Center, uh, Christine, you'll probably yeah. see it all over social media. God, uh, yes. They're taking, um, they're, they have a trip called Sankofa, and they're taking um, mm -hmm. probably about 30 folks <clears throat> down to D.C., um, yes, and if I don't, I'm not going to uh, drop it in the chat or anything like that. But if, I, I'm pretty sure everybody's on social media all of the time. You should probably see it floating around on Facebook and Instagram, or you can just reach out to me directly, and I can just mail it to you. But they're still raising money. Uh, I think they're, I think they're still maybe a little bit behind, and they're supposed to be leaving out. I think at the end of next week. So for folks. Okay. Who are, like invest in that and be a part of that uh, that National Museum of African American History and Culture uh, down there is is kind of a pretty it's big an deal. extraordinary institution, by the way. If anybody's not in there, it's like ridiculous. Just amazing. Yeah, I think I cried when I went through there. Um, but I think yeah. that's the major the major stuff that's happening uh, with the Richard Kim Center, and I wanted okay. to also remind you. Uh, in, in case you're watching, you'll see um, I'll be having a conversation about some of what we just talked about on, on my um, television program tomorrow evening at five, live at 525 here in Burlington. Ah. So just so if you if you want to come on and talk um, or if you or you can zoom in or something like that, let me know if any if there's anybody on the panel that that, and that, okay. goes, that goes for anybody if you want to just talk about it if you don't if you don't feel like it's compromising you in any way. I understand that you can't always say what you want to say. So I get that. Uh, and then uh, also on the um, on Thursday, I just wanted to let you know that there that we will be having a conversation about the uh, about equal protection uh, and um, as well as um, reparations, which okay. I don't know that you noticed it or not, but this is the third biennium that we had a reparations bill die. Uh, in in the um, in the house, um, but there is a reparations task force in Burlington, uh, politically compromised, but here nonetheless. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, some of that as well. So I would invite you, if again you can catch it on social media, um, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, all three of those, um, and you can either come to the Richard Kim Center or. You can just jump in on Zoom. I'd love to see some of y'all's faces. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, these um, these conversations. Uh, thanks Amazing. for. Thank you, Mark. Uh, hey, Tom. Yes. Uh, can I just? Uh, I'm not sure if this was mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, uh, but there's a concern, and I think it falls within the, you know, let's say the nexus. Uh, yes. of our that's mission uh, and I know everybody wears a different hat in this room uh, at some point other, uh, but there, there is a major shift you're breaking up coach of the governor's uh, okay uh, Please take a look at what is in the news regarding the governor's selection of the Ministry of Education. And Coach, behind... Coach, if you can hear me, because you keep coming in and out and it's hard, I get, you know, it's like a little bit Oops. of the information. We comes... broke. Okay. Can okay. you let, send let me, me a that quick... cleared up? Okay, go ahead. Is it better now? It seems to be. Yeah, I got past the weird spot uh, <laughs> near Sharon. <laughs> uh, so, so, anyways, uh, it's the assault on public education, uh, and the Senate has the advise and consent option right now right on the new secretary oh uh, my god yes and this person oh god i'm trying to remember she was there yes 
Okay, I remember. Uh, I think it would behoove everyone to at least take a look at the Digger article. Yes. Uh, and then make your own opinion. And if you agree with the thinking of many of us, get in touch with your senator and not suggest, but tell them because this is an election year, they have an opportunity to be courageous. And if they don't, education in Vermont will never be the same. Got it. Thank it, you. It, it is that uh, historic what's going on. Got it. All right. Hey, Tan, I just want to uh, take that uh, direct everybody's attention to that last thing I dropped is I forgot about that, but it's uh, we're we're also looking at um, Act 250. There's a conversation uh, that we're having about Act 250. Uh, I think it's on the 21st, if I'm not mistaken. No, a 18th. It's the 18th, April 18th. Uh, racial diversity and and wealth equity, uh, the impacts on um, that that Act 250 has had in in why we're not having the conversations on um, harm and repair as we're having conversations surrounding the other areas where Act 250 has impacted Vermont. It's a, it's a perfect example where you got exclusionary policy that at the end of the day ends up hurting everybody. Uh, the question is, is what we do about uh, repairing? How do we address that policy in a way where it's actually reparative as opposed to kicking the can down the road? But again, we also have to stay within our lane, don't we? Like we were just talking about. Yeah, education. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Anything else? No. So should we just go away? We have no <laughs> ritual for this. <laughs> I'll say good evening, since no one has another point. Good evening to you all. I will send you emails. Thank you for your work. This was a good meeting. <laughs>